today we're going to talk about chronic pain and chronic pain coaching. And I have to say, um, those of you that are connected to me on LinkedIn or social media might know that I just actually went through the training program that Take Courage Coaching offers and am now a health and wellness coach. So I really do um, have a lot of personal um, love and um, care about this program and this topic. So um, with that, um, I'm Yvonne Guibert. Most of everybody knows me as a marketing consultant. I also do that. And um, I want to have the panel introduce themselves real quickly. Um, so when I call on you guys, just take a quick um, few seconds to introduce yourself and your background. So we'll start with Becky. Hi, I'm Becky Curtis, and I am a nationally board certified health and wellness coach. And I'm also the CEO and founder of Take Courage Coaching. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Thanks, Becky. Kendi? Hi, I'm Kendi Anderson, and I live in Northern California, and I'm also a national board certified health and wellness coach and a chronic pain management coach. Great. And Jim? Hi, I am a, a client and have been a client for uh, almost 12 years of Take Courage Coaching. I'm 63 and uh, just retired and moved to Missoula, Montana. Awesome. I hear it's beautiful there. It is gorgeous. <laughs> and Although it was zero two days ago. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Um, okay, Les? So I'm Les Curte. I'm a... Uh, trained as a clinical psychologist and uh, I have about a tw 20 years of experience in uh, disability uh, medicine and consulting in the industry. Thank you. And I think we, be I believe we met at Comp Laude as well, Les, is that right? Yeah, we did. We did. Awesome. That's exactly right. Awesome. Okay, Chase, if we can start to the next slide. So today, um, on the, the learning objectives. Today, we're going to talk about pain coaching and establishing restorative partnerships. Got to keep clicking. Yeah, there we go. And then identify um, how techniques used in pain management coaching increase compliance and functionality, and also how um, positive effects in groups um, can affect pain management uh, positively. So those are our learning objectives. And we're going to start off with having Becky share more about her story. Well, hello everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I wanna just say that I know a lot about pain and everything I know about pain, I started by learning by accident. As you can see, this is my Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, 15 years ago, I was in a rollover car accident in the middle of nowhere in Montana. I My, my tire hit the side of the road, I overcorrected and I rolled about a hundred yards. When the car came to a stop, I knew that I had broken my neck. I couldn't feel anything from the neck down. I was having a hard time breathing. I had two collapsed lungs, a broken neck, broken ribs, broken clavicle out in the middle of nowhere. Um, the ambulance was called for, and when they arrived, they had just the equipment needed to take me um, out of the vehicle safely and get me to the hospital in Butte. Um, for anybody who has been to Butte before, um, <laughs> this is, um, Butte is now one of my favorite places, but you know, I was, when I was in this accident, I would have never said, I've been in a terrible accident, please take me to Butte, but they had a wonderful trauma surgeon there, he was on duty that night, he was able to do the surgery needed, and took out all the little shards of bone that were around my spinal cord, and the next day told my husband that she's going to walk again. I worked really hard. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, I, I worked really hard to get my, my function back. Um, it was a lot of hard work. And um, little by little by little, I, um, I, I was able to use my limbs um, and able to to do all the things I needed to do to function in life. But two years after my injury, I was, uh, I was just, um, I, I started having this burning nerve pain. And as I started having this burning nerve pain, um, I just thought, well, you know, I already had pain. I have pins and needles from the neck down. 
I have electrical pain that goes down my left side. And I had normalized those things, that constant nerve pain from the neck down, inside and out, was really, really um, difficult for me. And so my doctor and I, we tried all kinds of different medications to get my pain under control. And by the time my medications are high enough to do anything um, for my pain, I'm not functioning. So I was finally sent to a pain um, clinic where I learned that pain is processed in the brain and that I had some control over my, my pain. Um, and I decided then and there that if I ever got my own pain under control, that I wanted to spend the rest of my life helping people with chronic pain. So in 2012, I started to develop Take Courage Coaching. And, um, and I actually, it was 2009, I started developing Take Courage Coaching. Um, actually, two of my Two of my clients, my very first clients are on this call, Kendi and J Jim. I'm really glad that they're here. But I had this vision that people needed support as they started this process. Um, I was just recently, just this week, listening to a podcast by a doctor from England. His name is Deep Deeprock Ravindran. I'm sure I said his name terribly. But he said that we have this model, this medical model, this do it for you model, which is great when we have something acute. Um, he calls it the DFY, do it, do it for you. So there's a pill, a surgery, a procedure, something that's going to take away your experience of pain. And that's what I had at the beginning. I had a surgery and then I had rehab and I got better. But now this syrinx and I'm going down and things are not going well. Um, doctor, this doctor also says that we also have the do-it-yourself model, the DIY model where we have self-management and that's a scary place for a lot of people and he said what we're missing and this is what I knew 15 or 12 years ago when I started this what I what I knew was missing was the do it with you model the DWY model and that's what coaching is it's that walk along beside you and give you the tools that you need to be a self-manager instead of a passive patient so I started Take Courage Coaching with this in mind, with this, this model of walking alongside someone, giving them all the tools they need. And, and that's where we started nine years ago. So my intention then and my intention now is to um, make pain coaching the standard of care for people living with chronic pain. Okay, so let's... um. We had a little snafu with the video. We had a video to show, but um, something happened. That's okay. And it didn't work today. So I want to back up. You mentioned it, Becky, but I want to kind of focus on this one point for a second. So yeah, let's let's focus in on what was the specific thing that prompted you to want to start Take Courage Coaching? What was the spark? Well, I got I got my own pain under control. And I just, it was the darkest place I'd ever been was that chronic pain place. And once I got my own pain under control, I knew that there were other people. I was in this, in this pain program with 12 other people and I went home and had a great support system and I'm kind of a glass half full person, not kind of, I am. <laughs> and so I was able to do well, but I was in talking to the people I went through that program with, they didn't have the support they needed. They didn't have what it took to really get out of that hole in the three weeks that they were in that pain program. So that was my, that was kind of where, where I started was seeing that there was a need. And in working with the VA for the last eight years, when we started working with them, they said, this is the missing link. And that's what um, Dr. Ravendron says as well. He says we're missing a link, although I haven't been able to talk to him yet. I, I want to talk to him because I want to let him know we've filled that gap and, um, and we have. So 
Well, and, and also, and we'll talk, when we talk to Jim, we'll hear a little bit more of this perspective, but you know, I know you are a glass half full person and I, I'm sure you did do um, very well, but you've shared with me that, and you mentioned you got to a really dark place in your journey with pain. And so mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about that. Like, you know, because you went through rehab and I wish we had been able to show the video. We'll get it. I think we'll get it at the end. If not, we'll send it to folks to watch um, later. But you had a really hard road during rehab. There was a lot of hard work involved in that. And it was after yes. you'd been in rehab for a while that you started experiencing the pain. Is that right? Yeah, two years out. So that was a, was the extra. and that was something that was sort of a surprise. You weren't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that. You know, we have an injury and we think that things will get better and better and better. And it did for me. And then I developed the spinal cord syrinx, which is inoperable. It's in the middle of my spinal cord. If they go in and drain it, you know, we, you'd have to go through healthy spinal tissue and I could lose more function. So I'm not willing to do that. So then I'm, I'm left with it. So right. finding ways of managing that was, was a challenge, but I was able to do that. Okay. So Chase, we'll go to the next slide now. And, um, so this has a lot of words on it. And um, for the audience, this is really more for your reference. Um, what I'm gonna ask Becky to do is, so you had your, you started your company and about um, mm -hmm. 10 years in, so about two years ago, you submitted some data to a research group. And so talk to us about what they found when they analyzed the data from your coaching program um, at Take Courage Coaching. Well, they found that it works. And um, they found that when everybody works together to help people, it adds a lot of value to each client. Um, health and wellness coaching as a treatment option, they offer added value to the interdisciplinary care team. And that's what this doctor that I was, you know, that I, that I quoted earlier was saying as well, this is what's needed to be added to the care team to help the patient identify their values, their goals, to determine the most effective pain management plan for them. And this is going to help them be able to turn things around. We're really, really excited about the PLUS One study that was published um, just a few months ago. And um, maybe we can put a link in the, in the notes the link is right well. there. The link is right there. Oh, so for great. folks that are downloading the presentation, it should be live, but that's the, the, the link to that um, study summary right there. And it's mm -hmm. really interesting and I encourage you to check it out. So thank you, Becky. Now we're gonna shift mm -hmm. over to Jim. And jo Jim, thank you so much for joining us from beautiful Montana. And tell us now um, about your journey with pain. Uh, about, <clears throat> I'd say, 14 years ago. Um, first of all, it's great to be here. It's great to share my story. Uh, about 14 years ago, I had a series of sports uh, injuries, uh, water skiing, rock climbing, and a couple other things that um, left me in a, some severe uh, pain and finally decided after unsuccessful uh, physical therapy to do surgery. The surgery went awry, uh, some problems happened, some complications that left me in far worse pain than I had before the surgery. So I had another surgery to correct that surgery, that went worse. I had a third surgery to correct those two surgeries, that didn't work. So um, we tried a lot of different uh, remedies. I was living in New York City, um, I, had some very influential friends that had connections with the medical community, connected me with experts in neurology, uh, myalgia, pain management, um, quite a series of things. And I, I, I don't even remember how many treatments I went through. I went through the entire drug spectrum of what people thought I could try. Um, <clears throat> I kept trying things over and over, nothing uh, worked and so, Starting out uh, in pain, and then you have surgeries that lead you in worse pain. I was really upset. I was really struggling. Um, I was in constant pain. I couldn't sleep. Um, I couldn't work very well. I was down to like 5% of work. Um, and month after month would go on, and I kept trying things, and my hope kept getting dashed. 
I kept being told this will work, this will work, this will work. And it didn't. Um, I got into a place after a couple of years of this where I just thought I can't, I can't go on. I can't live. I can't live like this. Um, my career is Christian ministry. And in the Christian ministry, one of the big things that we talk about is hope. And I had no hope. I couldn't promote hope because I'd lost hope. Um, I got to the point where I started realizing what hell must be like. Hell is a place where you're hopeless, where there's no hope that anything's going to change. And I felt that that's where I was living. I was living in, in a form of hell where nothing was working. All the promises were dashed and, and I, I couldn't do it. And I felt so hypocritical in a way because I had a great life. I had a great job, a great congregation a great wife, wonderful kids, um, wonderful friends. Uh, I, I, it was so difficult to, to deal with this. So, but I got into this position where I didn't want to live. I, if I can't have hope, I can't live. I can't do this. Um, I remember saying over and over to people, I can't deal with this. I can't do this. I can't do this. So, so it led to me really wanting to die. I remember in particular getting onto flights. And this is hard to talk about because it's so inconsistent with my values. But I would get on a flight and and I'd pray that the, the plane would crash. And I'd really pray that because of my faith. I I couldn't commit suicide, although I certainly could relate to people that did. In fact, I thought, why don't more people do this? Because this is if you're living in a hell, you want it to end. But I would get on a flight and I would pray, God, take the plane down. And I, I'd also pray, God, please help no one talk to me about this prayer, because I was afraid people would say, oh, I'm so-and-so. What's your name? I'm Jim. What do you do? Oh, I'm a minister. Oh, did you pray for the safety of everyone on board the flight? And I'd be like, uh, I couldn't be honest because I no, I didn't. I actually plane, prayed this plane would go down. Um, but that's where I was at. I, I, I just... I, I couldn't stand life, and uh, I, I felt no hope. My sister is a nurse practitioner in Montana, where I grew up. I was living in New York at the time, but um, she convinced me. She had heard of uh, Becky and her program, Take Courage Coaching, and she convinced me uh, that I needed to talk to her. And since I really had given up on traditional medicine, I thought there's nothing else I can try. Everybody was arguing about what the problem was. Neurologists were saying it's the problem of the muscles, and uh, muscle specialists were saying no, it's a neurology problem. Uh, I thought, well, okay, this is this is it. I have nowhere to turn. So I went ahead and sat down with Becky. I, I was not convinced. Uh, Becky shared her program with me. I had a very difficult time believing it would work for me, um, but she had a lot of facts, and I couldn't really argue with that. Um, so I decided to go ahead and, and try it. I, I had nowhere else to turn. So, and it took a long time. It took time to see results. It took a lot of time for me to, to believe it would work first of all, and then just seeing results, but through the tools that she gave me, first of all, education, just showing facts, uh, similar to what she talked about, um, and the tools, but the, the number one thing that helped me, whew, is coaching. Um, you know, I can get facts from books and I can learn a lot of stuff from doctors. But the one thing I couldn't get and didn't get was encouragement and coaching. And that's what I needed. I needed people that could relate to chronic pain. I needed people that could hold me accountable in a way that was effective for me. Um, and mainly I just needed encouragement. Um, you know, I, I play classical piano and I needed a lot of coaching to become good. Um, in the ministry, I needed a lot of coaching to become an effective public speaker. And I think here we are expecting people to deal with chronic pain um, and not in, not coach them and not encourage them and not give them the, 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 um, the help on that level. And 
you know, if I were going for the Olympics, I'd get the best coach I could possibly get because I want a gold medal. And I tell you, there's nothing more important than struggling through, for me, than struggling through chronic pain and needing a good coach that's going to go for a bronze and then a silver and then finally a gold. So I'm super, super grateful um, to be able to have found uh, Take Courage Coaching. Uh, grateful to share my story because I truly believe as well <clears throat> there are so many people out there that are hurting so badly that have so little hope and this can give them exactly what they need it'll give them their hope back I'm drug free um, I still have pain but it's the levels are so far down uh, the neuroplasticity has worked for me and so uh, I'm super grateful and uh, I just want to tell everybody about it as well because it's uh, it's it's done amazing things for my life well thank you so much for sharing your story jim um very powerful and appreciate you sharing sharing so much of your story i was going to ask you but you kind of touched on it i'm going to draw it out here a little bit so you mentioned that it took a long time before you started to see results so what was the thing that kept you coming back to the coaching um when you weren't seeing results I think a lot of facts. I mean, Becky encouraged me to read the book, The Brain That Changes Itself, and I did. At least I got as far as I could get. I didn't actually finish it. Um, but she kept assuring me that these things have worked. They worked for her. And that was huge for me because I saw her example and, and she had shared her story. And so factually, I knew it was true because it worked for other people. And I think that so even though I didn't see it working for me at that point, um, just the facts and the encouragement to keep going, to keep persevering, that it would work, I would be able to see things. I saw little, little things at first. It's not like I didn't see anything, but I still struggled with, will it really work in the long run? Or is this enough for me to feel results? So again, it was that encouragement uh, to keep going that, that kept me on the path. Well, thanks. So um, we're going to go into let's not let's stay on this slide for a second, Chase, before we go. But um, before we advance into the the pain coach perspective, I want you each panelist to weigh in because I know that you can all connect to this journey that Jim has just shared with us. So, Becky, um, any other words that you'd like to add after hearing Jim's story and comparing it to your own story? Um, we're, we're sure that there are other injured workers out there that are in a position similar to this, right? Yes, there are many. And Jim was, you know, he was one of my very first clients and we've improved things so much since he was in the program. But it's so rewarding to see someone go from, I hope the plane crashes to, hey, I'm doing life. I'm, I'm in South America. I'm going to South America <laughs> on a trip with my wife. You know, this is the person who really wasn't he you know like he said he really wasn't doing his job his family was sad and it's just um just so neat to see people change their complete completely change their paradigm on what pain is and how it affects their life and it's 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 really neat to see jim today yeah <laughs> where he's at and less how how about you like from a from a perspective of a psychologist and hearing some of Jim's uh, very honest uh, accounts of his story. What would you say? Well, it, it, things I was thinking as I was listening to your, to your story, Jim, is that, you know, this is, this is the story I see a lot in people who have really severe chronic pain. And it is that loss of hopelessness that sort of lives in the, uh, on the edge well, it doesn't live on the edge. I mean, diagnostically, you're describing perfectly a major depressive episode. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it is clinically a, a, a depressive episode. Well, what's important about that is that, you know, we could have thrown an antidepressant at you. We could have done short-term psychotherapy to that probably would have been helpful with those feelings. But what you needed was you needed somebody to who was able to be there with you and walk with you through that journey. You know, that's that's what restores hope. So it, it's not an either or. It, there, 
there are multiple things going on here and you can look at it from different perspectives. The important thing is the personal connection. Um, and I, mm. I, I think that was fair. Uh, that was a really powerful part of your story. The part okay. of it is knowing, knowing that I felt believed in that this, this is going to change. Becky really communicated that. And she had a lot, she had a lot of conviction that this was going to be different for me. Um, mm. And that helped tremendously. And in the coaching. Share your thoughts from the perspective of a pain coach. Um, first of all, what is it? Tell us a little bit about what it is. So a pain coach is is that person that walks along beside the person in chronic pain. And I, I just want to key in on something Jim said, that that hopelessness. I mean, anybody that has dealt with chronic pain understands that hopelessness. And I remember back to the beginning of my journey when I was a client. Uh, Becky saying to me, I have enough hope for both of us. And that's, we've kind of rolled that forward throughout Take Courage Coaching because we do start with people that really have lost all hope. They feel like there is nothing else for them. So that, I, I would say in a nutshell, we're the ones saying, hang on to my hope until we find yours. That's a good way to put it. Okay, Chase, you can advance to the next um, points now. Um, and so, yeah, just go ahead and roll through and then we can go to the, the next slide. So what coaches do, Kendi, um, talk a minute about motivational interviewing and some of the tools used in, in, in coaching. Sure. So there's lots of coaching theories out there um, and good coaching theories. But in the, in, a, in the chronic pain world, we have found the gold standard is motivational interviewing. And that in that spirit of... MI is what it's shortened to. We're looking for a non-judgmental, uh, you are the expert on yourself, and how do I help you pull out what's inside of you? In other words, you, you, you have the answer already, and I'm there to help you find that hope and pull it out and be able to move forward. And that's, that's what the coaching process really looks like when we work with clients. So a year, we work with them a year. Um, they have a one-on-one -on -one call with their coach every single week, and they also have a group coaching call every week. And that, that's kind of the educational part that Jim was talking about, um, where we give them a lesson and we introduce tools to them. And they get in a space where, the, I, I mean, I just hear over and over and over as a coach, you people get me. And they're talking about their group mates. And that is, that is very, very powerful. I can tell you from my perspective as being a client, that was the most powerful part of the coaching relationship. And I, I had the best. I had Becky. She was my coach. <laughs> and she did a fabulous job. But that was very powerful to connect with other people that were walking the same walk you were. Yeah. So the pain coaching program has a weekly call with the client, and then they have a weekly group session where several other people are in the same group and they get to interact and work on finding and discovering tools and things together, right? Yes, so we're introducing a tool to them every week. We start with that foundational things where we're, we're talking about neuroplasticity. We're talking about the mind-body connection. We're talking about what Becky talked about, how pain really lives in the brain. So we're, we're making those connections for clients in the very beginning and what, once they kind of catch the vision, then they can begin implementing the tools. So those group sessions, not only do they set the stage for what's happening from a, like a brain pain standpoint, but then we're handing them a new tool every week for the remaining 52 weeks that they're working with us. And they begin to try them. And some of them, you know, I'll, remember, I'll, I'll go back to something that my coach said to me. When I said, uh, well, you know, this, so this helps a little bit, right? Maybe I was working on diaphragmatic breathing. This helps a little bit. And my coach said, but Kindy, what if you have six tools that all help 5%? And that was powerful to me. Very powerful. So that's part of the process. You walk with the client, work with the client, and not everything works for every person. Some things work really great. For, for some people and not for others. So it's about discovering each person, each client, 
discovering the tools that work best for them. Is that right? That's exactly right. And sometimes uh, in the process, what's happening is we have introduced a tool for group that week, and that is just a springboard for the client to come up with their own tool or the own, they're, they're, they, they make it theirs. I've, I've had clients that have discovered tools just by experimenting that wasn't part of our list of tools that we're handing them. So yes, they're, they get a chance to test drive tools as it were and see which ones work for them. Awesome. So I think we already talked about this, but so the, the coaching is handled telephonically. And now with today's pandemic world, we're doing things in a virtual uh, space if, if the client so desires. Um, how does it help? So I think we kind of already talked about this, but any other thoughts, any additional thoughts on how it helps people like Jim? Um, you, as you mentioned, you are also a client um, with chronic pain. So anything we haven't mentioned yet that is something that you want to talk about how coaching really supports the person's own journey? Yes, so I think something that's very powerful in the coaching relationship is sometimes this is the first time where someone has really, really listened to the client. They have come from a, a medical model where it's very directional and motivational interviewing is not directional at all. We are more in a guiding role. So we're there, like I say, to help them find their own their own motivation and their own uh, their own path and on the journey. So I think the one of the powerful things is that component of here's someone who is listening to me and not judging me and not saying, well, this is what you need to do. So I I think that's very, very it's it's a light bulb moment. And really that the engagement that happens at that point is amazing because most often they're used to not being listened to and their coach is all ears. Right. And we're going to start talking to Les in a moment, and, but I see a word here that I know Les is um, looking at, the biopsychosocial component. So um, just a second, Les, like what about that is, is important for us to understand in terms of treating patients and, and injured workers? Well, I, I think what biopsychosocial tells us is that, you know, uh, pain lives in at, at, at the intersection of biology, internal psychology, kind of people's attitudes, how how, how we function. You know, Becky described herself as a half a, a glass half full person. Um, you know, those kind of internal traits, the psychological part. And it's also happening in a context. We are in families, we are in communities, we have jobs with them, you know, employers or we work for ourselves. And unless we relate to all three of those components, it's really hard to do anything with pain. Um, I, I mean, pain is not going to respond to any one of those components alone. It's going to respond to to paying attention to the intersection. Okay. Not so, that I have an opinion about it. But. <laughs> <laughs> so Chase, you can go ahead and uh, I'm going to speed it up because we've been chatting and having a great conversation. So well, as we've mentioned, um, and Kendi has pointed out, it's a non-judgmental partnership. The focus of coaching is to build trust, rapport, and confidential support. We talked about this. I don't know if you guys were listening, but we had a session before this session that was all about empathy. So that was mm -hmm. a perfect segue into this conversation. Um, and it's client driven. As Kendi mentioned, coaching allows the client to drive the journey. So I think that's an interesting thing to to pull out here. And the coaches have ample time um, to spend with the clients to help them facilitate positive change. Um, okay, next. And then uh, Kendi, real quick. Um, talk to us about NB. So this industry workers compensation is right with acronyms. And here we've got another one that we're going to throw at them. NBHWC, what is it and why do we need to know what it is in this context? So in about 2016, there was a consortium that started pairing up with the um, medical examiners to create a nationwide standard. And through that partnership, 
they have created a board exam for health and wellness coaches that they launched, I want to say in 2017, maybe was the first test that they uh, that people could set for that first exam. And they have continued to offer that test uh, twice a year now, I believe, but it literally has become the standard because it's a board certification that, that health and wellness coaches can uh, take to you know, have that credential. It kind of sets the, sets the bar for what a health and wellness coach should look like. Okay. And Celeste, we're going to get into your perspective. Now, actually, I'm sorry, one more slide, Chase. And um, again, audience, this is more for your edification so that you have this definition. Um, if you download the presentation, this is the MBHWC's definition of what health and wellness coaching and pain coaching falls within this category. Uh, it's a specialized um, type of health and wellness coaching. Um, okay, so thank you, Kendi. And Les, now we're gonna dive in a little bit more to the provider perspective. And um, as you mentioned, you are a psychologist and also a medical director for a large um, group healthcare firm. So let's talk about, again, how, why is this such a good option for people that have gotten to that space where um, they're, they're hopeless? They're, there have been many types of treatments that have been tried and don't work. Why is this a good option and, and what should we know about any concerns? Um, you know, one thing that, that has really struck me today, and we can go ahead and put up all the points for this slide if that might make it easier. Um, you know, one of the things that really struck me, for example, about the study that was done is that it, it didn't replace the multidisciplinary team. It, it facilitated it. It added some, something of value. So this is not, in my mind, an either-or question. Right? There are times when medical treatment is appropriate. There are times when medical treatment is entirely inadequate. And chronic pain is just one of those places where medical treatment alone typically is entirely inadequate. Um, it, it doesn't get the job done because it doesn't get at um, the, the kind of underlying hopelessness of what happens in a chronic condition. Um, you know, I, I think you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is that in, you know, I've been preaching about the biopsychosocial model and the importance of paying attention to psychological components in claims forever. And for the longest time, especially in, in workers' compensation, we were all terrified of the word psycho, uh, of anything with the word psycho in it, <laughs> right? Because we thought it meant we had to buy a new part of the claim. Well, talked about, about, talked about that yeah. in the empathy session, yeah. You know, about six or seven years ago, we started to wake up and the rest of the industry sort of caught up and said, well, no, it really is important. The problem is that we have, I don't think we've really delivered on a system that can actually help. And so the industry is kind of getting a little bored with the idea. But I think what's important is that is this notion of an interdisciplinary team and addressing what needs to be addressed when it's addressed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, stress is, a, is something everybody experiences, and it's sometimes it's a barrier. Life stressors are a barrier to recovery. Um, psychological symptoms are just that. They're symptoms. And mm -hmm. we all experience you know, moments of, of being feeling blue, moments of being anxious. You know, anybody who's never been anxious in their life, raise your hand, right? Um, and then there are psychiatric conditions. So I'm gonna talk about this from a mental health perspective. And you know, a true psychiatric crisis probably will benefit from a medical, if you will, treatment on a short-term basis. But in terms of chronicity, it's not going to get, it's not gonna solve everything. You know, part of me, I, I have, Becky knows this about me, I, I always struggle about the difference between coaching and, and psychotherapy, because in my mind, 
good psychotherapy is also not very directive. It's also about sitting with someone as they experience their life and walking with them in doing that, right? Um, unfortunately, short-term, you know, six sessions of CBT doesn't allow for that. Uh, so I, I think that there are components of this and what we've got to really pay attention it, to is we need the right tools in the right place at the right time. And we have to be, very, we have to be adaptive to what's needed. It, while we're talking to worker people in the workers' comp system, there's a lot that claims managers can do by simply being with people. Um, there's a huge opportunity that we have to pay attention to these principles and make it better. Um, so I, I, I think that we we have to be sensitive in coaching. We have to be sensitive to the fact that there may be a psychiatric crisis that needs something more than coaching and be be willing to refer for that. But also as medical providers, we have to be willing to acknowledge that what we're dealing with is a person in a context and not a condition, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's really the bottom line of what I would say about this. Tell us why they're temporary, or maybe not why they're temporary, but what does it mean? How, what, why is that important to the audience in terms of what it's temporary and, and what next? Well, what it means is that these are codes that can be used to a, to put a label on a service. And the reason what temporary means is that they're being temporarily adopted to allow time for people to use these, these interventions and determine if they're helpful. Um, uh, you know, there are behavior, there are um, health and wellness codes that psychologists can use that are now permanent. Right. These are health and wellness coaching codes that are there so that there's a way to formally incorporate this into treatment and to allow payers to address it. Um, and uh, and presumably when you know, when it, as we find that it's helpful, they'll they're likely to become permanent. But that's a that's a decision made at a different level than than where we are. Right. Sure. But that's what it means. So audience, um, the link there is a press release that um, made the announcement when these CPT codes were introduced last year. It's just last year, about a year ago. And this was a collaboration between the MBHWC and the Veterans Administration. So if you'd like to read that press release, it's there. And OK, now, um, Chase, next slide. Let's talk briefly. And um, I'm going to speed things up a bit so we stay on time. So what we're talking about here is a paradigm shift of sorts um, that, as Les was talking about a little bit, and what we've touched on is the system um, is more directive and coaching is not directive. And so, Kendi, why don't, why don't you start the discussion here on the paradigm shift? And I'm going to ask each of you to weigh in. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, uh, they when clients come to us, it's normally from a place of hopelessness and they really feel like there is nothing under their control. Uh, Jim talked about all the different, you know, the multiple surgeries he had had. And we see clients that have, that have exhausted every resource they can think of, both traditional and alternative, and always looking for that someone, surely if I just find the right person, the right pill, the right surgery, the right injection, can can fix me and when they by the time they hit us that's that's really where they're at and so this pain coaching becomes that paradigm shift where uh, we we encourage and walk along beside clients to move from that cure me mentality to what is under my control what are things that i can be doing rather than looking out for someone else to fix me mm -hmm. So when it doesn't, I'm going to ask each of you to kind of weigh in with your um, your thoughts briefly. But I, what strikes me about this paradigm shift and being in the workers' compensation industry for many more years than I wish to admit at this moment, um, <laughs> one of the things we talk about a lot is um, opioids and the problems with overprescribing of opioids. And there are some other we could have a whole session on that as an issue and 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 how we sort of deconstruct that problem, but. 
this is the thing that I think jumped out at me when I started to hear about this is that it shifts the focus from give me a pill to take away my pain, which is what a lot of us want or a lot of people ask for, um, to this is something I can live with. And this is something, um, it's, it's not pleasant, but I can learn to manage it. So let's each of you, Becky, what are your thoughts on that? Um, just real brief. My thoughts for myself were that I really wanted to be clear-minded and it's really hard to be heavily medicated. I couldn't read. I couldn't talk to my family very well during that time. I wasn't relating as a human very well. Um, being, And that's what we hear from so many of our clients. I agree with Les when he said those things have their place, but in something chronic, um, the you, you know, when you have to just live with it, it is it, the very best thing for us is to be clear minded. If we want to use neuroplasticity to rewire our brain and to put pain on the back burner or in the trunk or wherever we want to put pain, then we need to be as clear minded as possible. And so that's what we hear from our clients. And I think about 80% of them make the decision themselves to get off their medications. And that is that is their choice. I remember that day with Kendi. <laughs> and um, that that decision to let go of the curative and to and to start managing their own pain with their brain is is an exciting time. So as we um, start to see these slides now with the, the two brains and neuroplasticity. So Kendi, what are your thoughts on the shift? The shift from cure me to I can handle this. So it's a process. I can tell you personally, it took me about six months. So I'm very grateful that the TCC's program is a year because it took me that long to finally swallow the pill that said maybe this will work. You know, <laughs> I was just very skeptical up to that point. But it, it happens, you know, it's very individual with clients when that shift takes place. Um, I think. I'm going to touch back on something I said earlier, and that's that that space of you are really listening to me and you believe me. That seems to be a place where that shift starts to happen for clients. Right. OK, so Chase, next slide. So this slide is a brain, a normal brain. Here we see this is what we're talking about. When we're talking about ne neuroplasticity. And so flip back to the last slide again, Chase, so everybody can see. And then the next one. So, and then the next slide, um, Becky and Les, just, just real briefly, what are we talking about here? Neuroplasticity and the more we do certain things means what? I'll let you go ahead, Les. All right. <laughs> um, well, I think that at the bottom line of neuroplasticity is the fact that it's a, that experience and the brain are a two-way street. Our experience changes our brain and how our brain is working changes our experience. It is not one way. And it's not that whatever happens in the brain is real and what happens in experience is not. And that's where we get caught up when we talk about chronic pain a lot. Um, you, you know, just briefly, I have to go back to your your question about you know the changing from the cure me mode. The problem is with cure me is that it's a lie. I, I can't cure somebody else's pain. The, right. the problem is that you know there are areas of the brain that get lit up in chronic pain, not necessarily in acute pain. There's a real difference between acute pain and chronic pain, but in chronic pain. That's happening inside the brain, not in the not in the area that where you feel the pain. It's it's in the brain. Interestingly enough, those nine areas that we showed that are that are lit up are the same nine areas that light up in depression. They're the same nine areas that light up in chronic anxiety disorders. Um, and the idea that I can cure that with a medical model is simply wrong. Um, what we can do is help people relearn those things to quiet those areas so that you have less of an experience of pain, depression, anxiety, and then people get better. 
So I, right. to me, neuroplasticity and that model come together. Right. So the point is, and I don't think I clarified this, but you know, you can focus on the pain, like you said, that the brain is connecting together. And if you focus more on that, it makes that area more significant or worse. But if you do other things that I guess we'll use the word distractor or think about something else for a moment, then that lessens, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Okay. So Becky, real quick, we're going to talk about that process a little more here. Chase with the next slide. So, um, so we start out with the pain awareness and we, uh, most of the time, those of us that have chronic pain, we have a negative thought, like, I can't stand this pain one more second. That was a thought that I thought many, many times. I see Jim nodding his head. And um, so when we have that thought in our brain, our brain releases stress hormones and has, it triggers that amygdala, that, paras uh, that sympathetic nervous system, which is wonderful when you're being chased by a tiger. But when you have pain all the time, it's not so good. This increases muscle tension, which increases pain, and you get in this downward spiral. Instead, what we want is, and we want, we have that awareness of pain. So I'll just give you an example. I just did a car trip. So every bump in the road causes fresh burning for me still. So I, I go on a car trip and I have awareness of pain. Instead of that, I can't stand this pain one more second, I'm really confident that I'm going to make it through my day and I'm going to make it through my day with positive thoughts. So I, I have a thought like, oh, what a gorgeous fall day this is. I'm going to enjoy the scenery. I'm going to put on some music. I have a whole toolbox of things that I use. I can breathe from the diaphragm and bring my pain from an eight to a four on a scale of one to 10. And those are all things that I've practiced and I've used over and over and over again. So with the positive thoughts, it, that acceptance, relaxation, instead of tensing up and breathing short and shallow from the chest and telling my brain I'm being chased from a, by a tiger, I'm in this place of relaxation. Everything is okay. This is my normal. This burning nerve pain is not doing tissue damage. I'm really fine. And with that acceptance and relaxation, one thing that really helps me is increased movement. Um, so I'm on a car trip and this is painful, but I have all these different tools and I stop at a gas station and I get out and I stretch and maybe I walk for half a mile and I come back to my car. I have increased functionality. My spiral is going this way instead of this way. Mm -hmm. And so that is where the change comes in. For me. Okay. So coming to the end here, um, Becky and Les, you, you were going to, you had a couple of things to say about um, this slide here. So working with the VA for the last eight years, they have um, used some of their data um, with some of the people that we've worked with for more than um, for more than 100 days, and you can see that the decrease in morphine equivalent daily dose in the veterans that we were working with. Um, is 42.71% um, versus those who we haven't worked with for more than 100 days is 15.31% and those who never started were 20%. So they were really, really happy with these numbers. Um, it's really exciting to see people who are laying in a back room, um, laying in a recliner or in a back room for years get this kind of functionality back to their life. So we learn a lot about people and about pain in the brain by learning about phantom limb pain. So we know that people can lose a limb and they can still have the pain from that limb in their brain. Dr. Ramachandran is a doctor, he's a researcher who was working with a young man who had lost an arm in a motorcycle accident. And this pain, his arm was up like this and it wasn't there actually, but it was up like this and it was, he was just having lots of burning pain and his hand was in a fist. And he, Dr. Ramachandran came up with this idea for a mirror box. And I hope you all can see this picture of the mirror box. This is a picture of me using the mirror box. And he told the young man to put his stub in the one 
side, as you can see my bad, my bad side, <laughs> my bad arm is here. And as he, he told him to put it, that arm in there and then to put his good arm in the other side and to look in the mirror, the one side is a mirror and to look in the mirror and as he looked in the mirror at what, what, what his brain thought was two good hands, he exclaimed, my pain is gone. And Dr. Ramachandran said, I want you to close your eyes. And so he closed his eyes. And when he closed his eyes, he said, ah, my pain is back. Open your eyes. When he opened his eyes, his pain went away again. He took this mirror box home. And by looking in the mirror at what was good, what was healthy, what was whole, what was right, he was able to rewire his brain within six months. And as he rewired his brain, he, um, he as he practiced with that, that, that um, phantom limb that was in his brain went away. And that's what we help people as coaches. That's what we help people do. We help them to look at what's good, what's right, what's whole, what's healthy. We ask a question at the beginning of every coaching session. Tell me what's going well. And this is a hard thing for most clients because they're used to people saying, tell me on a scale of one to 10, what's your pain? And when we do that, where does that put the focus? That puts the focus on the pain. And I know that's necessary <laughs> in a medical model, but as we're working with people that are, that are struggling with chronic pain, we wanna put the focus on what's going well. And as we do that, people are able to rewire their brains. They're able to put pain on the back burner, put pain in the trunk. Um, and so that's the exciting part of working with people and coaching. Well, okay. So we have, that's the end of our presentation. I want to say thank you all. Thank you, Becky, Kendi, Jim, Les. Mm -hmm. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I could talk about this all day. Um, I think it's a fascinating topic. And uh, hi, Kristen. Hi. So do we have any questions for our panel? We do, we do. So again, thank you, round of applause. I think the whole audience would be um, giving you a round of applause. So I'll do it, yay. Um, so thank you for sharing the information. A lot of the sentiments is awesome panel. Thank you for sharing this information. Um, one of the questions, um, that came in, Becky talked about having a support system. What constitutes a good support system? Well, for me, it was my family, it was my friends, it was my church family, it was my neighbors. Um, but a lot of people that have chronic pain are laying in the back room and their wife has left them. They're sick and tired of, of pain ruling over their whole life. So a lot of, a lot of us that have chronic pain get caught up in, in talking about pain all the time and then people get sick of that and we lose that important support system that we have, which is where the coach comes in. And if the coach is a really great, great coach, then they are going to, to support that person getting back into some of their social support, encourage them to get out of the house and and do something other than just focus on their pain. Another question is for the panel. It says, can the panel talk about the importance of values and goals and how they impact recovery? What oh, who wants I, to start with that one? <laughs> one of the things I can say is the coaching did include that um, goals. And there was a accountability um, and that was very helpful because I left each session knowing what I needed to work on until the next session. And each day I would work on those things. And that gave me a, a great feeling of accomplishment, um, but it, it, it helped me make progress. It also helped me see progress as we talked about what I was supposed to be doing, what I did do, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and so that, that helped me a lot. Awesome. Kendi, would you like I to, would add, to add to that? Yeah. Yes, I would. So one of the beginning steps we have with clients is actually setting what we call a vision 
And what we're looking for are those very things that you mentioned, Kristen, you know, what are their values? What are their goals? And we craft over time with the client, their vision statement. In other words, what does their best self look like at a point in the future? Try not to make it a, you know, a numerical thing because then they get tied up in how can I meet those standards? But beginning with that vision statement, then we begin to, through the coaching process, watch for things that tie back into those values that we've heard. Um, mm-hmm. those, those things that are important to them and build on them and call them out, name them actually is very powerful in the coaching relationship because sometimes they don't, they don't see the connection with the, with the progress they're making because it may be very small, but we can be the one that points out that that directly ties to your values. So yeah, it's a powerful part of coaching. Anything else? Ah. A quick sentence. The quick sentence is that only people's own goals and values make a difference when you're dealing with a chronic condition. Yeah. You know, if I as a therapist have a goal for somebody, nobody cares. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One of the questions is, do carriers pay for this in Texas comp system? Oh, yes. good question. Oh, good. Okay. I think we've been paid for in 46 states, and Texas is one of them. Okay. It, um, one of the first questions that came in is, what coaching cert- certification was mentioned um, in the beginning? I think the first certification that we talked about was NBHWC as a board certified health and wellness coach. Also, we are certified um, internally through TCC. We also have a coaching school that's TCCU. And so we have the designation of chronic pain management coach also. So we have a CPMC certification. Yeah. And if anybody's responding or if they were, that was, I think I mentioned something about me just going through the certification. That's, the initial certification is health and wellness coach, which is what I just completed. Um, and then the next stage to get more specified into pain coaching is what Kenny just talked about, the advanced pain coaching. How important is physical activity to facilitate recovery? How can one do the physical activity when he, she is hurting? Mm. <laughs> Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> I think um, we probably all have something we could say about it, but I, I want to just say it's very important. I could do 90 seconds on the elliptical when I started, and um, I know Jim and Kendi started small as well, and I think it's really important to encourage people to just start where they are, and it's also important to make sure that what you're doing is safe. So I like to encourage people to work with a physical therapist when they first start because you are going to hurt worse if you've been laying in a recliner for years. And so we want to take away fear. We don't wanna have fear when we exercise. So if we hurt more, that's natural, that's normal. And knowing that is going to help us continue and build that strength. I don't know if Jim or Kendi wanna say anything about that. Again, that's a good, because uh, 90 seconds, it's like, oh man, I can't do this, I'm not doing it, but I did 90 seconds. so. In the coaching, it's like, oh, great, you did, you were able to do 90 seconds. Think about la- yesterday or last week, you, you couldn't even do five. And it's that <laughs> reinforcement, encouragement, coaching in that direction that um, produces the results and certainly produced the results in me. So even those little things, yeah, it took a while to get back to the bigger things, but now I'm doing almost everything. I'm back to almost full physical, all the sports I used to do. I'm able to do almost all of them. And the rest, the other two, there's two left that I I plan on doing as soon as I can. So now it's restored back the vision for uh, my life that I had even before all this began 14 years ago. Listen, I'm gonna gonna hit the road. I have to beat President Trump to the airport. So I'm gonna go start that. (laughs) I've got my lavender essential oil in hand so I can stay calm along the way. It's been great fun, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And you guys keep on going, and I'm going to bow out. Have yeah, a great day. Yeah. Thanks, Yvonne. Bye.
and safe travels. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So one um, comment was for Jim, and it just wanted to share that they had a dear friend um, that was a minister and did end their life to chronic pain. Um, and this was long before the medical community community knew how to address um, aside from opioids. So there's a lot of people that I feel are relating to the different stories that have been shared. Another one, um, thank you, Becky, for sharing your story, as well as Jim. Um, and how brave you guys are in doing what you do. So I just wanted to share that. Um, but one of the questions is, um, how important is faith or how can people use their faith in recovery? Wow. Well, uh, for me personally, this is a very personal question, of course, because everyone's faith is very personal. But for me, just knowing um, that God loves me, he has a plan for me, um and uh it brings me hope and so any help that i was getting i feel i felt that god was directing it and so that gives you a lot of confidence to know that god's behind this he's pulling for you he's going to work with you on this um gave me a lot it started building my hope as well and of course just knowing that you know, becky felt the exact same way that sure helped me a lot mm -hmm. I think um, I think something worth saying is that there there are two consistent predictors of good health and rec and recovery from illness. One is being in relationship, and the other is feeling connected to something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. re religious beliefs are one way to be connected to something bigger. There are other ways as well. Um, but I. I but regardless of what people's beliefs are, believing in something helps you believe in yourself. And last question, um, what does a medical support team typically look like? Do the coaches work with the medical team? We like to. Um, we have different places um, in the United States where we have a doctor and a physical therapist and the coaches all working together. We love it when that can happen. Sometimes it's just physical therapy and the coach. Sometimes it's just the doctor and the coach. Sometimes it's the psychologist and the coach working together. Um, we also work with a lot of case managers and adjusters. And we love to just be part of the team when we can. Um, we are also we also work as aftercare for some really big functional restoration programs. So a, a patient will go through a functional restoration program, and then when they get home, they have the coach, and that's all set up. And that works really, really well. Um, we, we are a standalone program, but we also like to work in conjunction with other programs and provide that ongoing, continuing support, which we know that the patient needs. All right. Well, um, everybody's contact information is on the screen or in the presentations that are downloadable. So I'm sure if you do have questions, anybody would be open. Or if you would like to share your comments with them, I know that they would appreciate it because it was a lot to get on here. So thank you so much, panel, for being part of Comp Laude 2020 Virtual. Um, we could not do what we do without you. Thank you, Becky, for um, continuing to support what we do and also continue to share your story. I know it's been over five years since um, you know we've known you and being a part of Comp Laude, So thank you um, for all that you do, and thank you, panel. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you, Kristen, and Bye. thank you, Jim and Candy and Les. Really appreciate you guys joining me. Thank it's you. awesome. Yeah.